In this lesson, we're looking at gene regulation. This is quite a large topic, so it's going to be cut up into two chunks. Right, so far we've learned that gene expression is a process which produces either a protein or a gene product, like a piece of RNA, so like tRNA or rRNA. Since we also know that almost every single cell in an organism will contain the full copy of every single gene in the genome, we know there's got to be a way to regulate which ones are expressed and which ones aren't. So sometimes we say turned off or turned on. Now, if uh, a cell has to make every single protein or gene product available in its genome, it would be such a waste of time and energy. Um, our skin cells don't need to make hemoglobin, for example. They aren't transporting blood gases. So cells in every organism have ways to regulate which genes are transcribed and translated, when and how much. Now, the genes that are expressed will dictate what physical characteristics an organism has. Now, some genes need to be expressed early on in, in life, in, say, at embryonic development. Um, others need really only to be made later on, say, when puberty hits. Some need to be expressed constantly throughout life, like those associated with, say, cellular respiration. Um, and those ones are known as housekeeping genes because they're always around managing cellular activities day to day. Now, gene regulation can occur over a short or a long-term time frame. Now, short-term regulation, I'm talking here managing things like day-to-day -day gene expression and the contents of specialized cells so that they can perform their specialized functions. Long-term regulation, we're talking multicellular organisms need to be able to develop through different life stages with all the appropriate cells and tissues that they need. So whether it's managing the really big picture development or everyday functions of the cell, um, it can occur at a lot of different uh, stages. So for example, prior prior to transcription, post-transcription or prior to translation, during translation or after translation. So on a really big scale during embryonic development um, of an organism throughout its lifestyle, but also to start with, we're going to discuss that day-to-day -day management in the really small. So we know that DNA strands are really tightly coiled in around the histone proteins and these are packaged up in a condensed form to, uh, as known as chromatin. So the only way that a gene can be transcribed through the DNA unwinding from the histone and allowing access to the RNA polymerase to make that corresponding mRNA. Once the gene is accessible, it can be considered switched on, right? If it's accessible, we can trans uh, transcribe it and therefore it's on, it can be um, created into something. But if it's still wrapped up, that DNA is wrapped up really tightly around the histones, it doesn't allow for the mRNA. The, sorry, the RNA polymerase to access the gene, meaning it's effectively switched off. Now, chromatin can be chemically modified to allow certain genes to be unwrapped, exposed, and transcribed. And with this process is known as methylation and acetylation. Acetylation occurs when the acetyl group is added to amino acids on the tails of the histone protein, so over here. And what it does, it loosens the attraction between the DNA in the histones and it opens it up and allows for transcription. So it's a switched on gene. The opposite is methylation. So a methyl group is added in these tails again, and it actually increases the attraction between the histone and the DNA. So it coils it even tighter, making it inaccessible, and therefore the gene is switched off. So this is a nice uh, quick summary of that. Now, the same modifications can actually occur on the DNA strand itself. Methylation and acetylation can stimulate or disable the transcription of some genes. So other substances like phosphate groups or other small proteins uh, can do this job as well. And there's an example um, known as X inactivation in biologically female mammals. Now, X, there's two X chromosomes here, um, but one will usually be deactivated through meth methylation so that only one chromosome, one X chromosome, has genes transcribed from it. It's not jumping between the two. So the same thing will happen in genomic imprinting, uh, where some genes, whether it be maternal or paternal, are silenced and not transcribed. Transcription of some genes can actually be impacted by other products created by transcription. So for example, you might be talking gene A has been made um, and it's been prevented from being transcribed usually um, because something that uh, is created by gene B is actually stopping it from doing that. Now, proteins that bind to DNA uh, to, to influence another gene's transcription, and they're actually known as transcription factors, and they are proteins. So some activate gene expression by doing things like unwinding that DNA from the histone protein. Others actually repress transcription by doing things like 
binding to the uh, DNA template strand and blocking RNA polymerase from attaching at that promoter. So to study these types of proteins, uh, scientists often look at types of prokaryotes uh, because they're a bit more simple to follow. So an example of a transcription factor which can repress transcription is known as the LAC operon. It exists in E. coli and an operon, this word here, it's essentially a gene that can be switched on and off using a promoter region right at the start of the gene, uh, which RNA polymerase can bind to. So in the LAC operon, there's multiple genes and they actually code for an enzyme which can break down lactose. Now, lactose isn't the most ideal source of energy, right? They want to use something like glucose, but if it's going to be there, they're going to use it. Um, they prefer not to, though. The problem is it needs to be broken down, and if it's not there, there is no point creating this enzyme because it's a waste of energy. So there's actually always this repressor protein, this transcription factor here, blocking the gene from being transcribed, right? This is occurring right at that operator sequence, right after the promoter. So only when lactose is actually present does the lactose bind to the repressor and then it actually deactivates the transcription factor and moves it out of the way from blocking the RNA polymerase from binding and it allows the transcription to occur. So essentially the bacterium only needs those enzymes if the lactose is present. So once it is present, it allows the transcription factor to occur. So it allows the transcription to occur by getting the repressor out of the way. Now, the flip side of this is the trip operon, which exists in bacteria as well, and it actually codes for tryptophan. Now, tryptophan is an amino acid. We need to ingest it because we can't actually create it. However, bacteria can. Um, they have genes there that can code for it, which produces all the building blocks needed to make tryptophan. Obviously, if tryptophan has already been ingested, there is no need for the organism to make it themselves, right? So this gene doesn't need to be transcribed. So in the presence of tryptophan, it actually binds this repressor, okay? So when tryptophan is present, you know, if it has been ingested, there is no need to make it. So that repressor suddenly attaches. This is a transcription factor. So this is a kind of negative feedback. If something is already available, it switches it off. However, the lac operon is a kind of positive, um, so it does the opposite.